Hello, and welcome to my YouTube channel. I am your host, Andrew Hamill. I'm an American lawyer, writer, translator, and journalist. I'm broadcasting from far above the mean streets of Dusseldorf, Germany, the only German city with more plastic surgery per capita than Los Angeles. This podcast will take a look at crime, law, and justice on both sides of the Atlantic. I will release videos in German and English, depending on the subject and audience. The production values will improve as I go along, I promise. The first season will be devoted to the Jens Zering case. This first video will be an introduction to the case. In this episode, we'll go into the background and the main pieces of evidence against Jens Zering. I've split the video by subject, so you can choose what interests you most. Later videos will be more specific and probably shorter. The case of Yin Zering was the subject of two major documentaries released in early November 2023. The first is a 90-minute feature entitled Murder, Power, and Media, broadcast on the nationwide ARD channel here in Germany. The second is called Till Murder Do Us Part, Zering vs. Hasem, a four-episode documentary series broadcast worldwide on Netflix. I was a featured interview guest on both series. Before we go any further, a plug for my new book, Martyr or Murderer, Yin Zering, the Media and the Truth. This book tells the entire story of the case from the moment Yin's and Elizabeth met in 1984 to just weeks ago, late October 2023. I base the book on the most reliable sources, court transcripts, interviews, expert reports, and first-hand accounts. I also include some revelations from confidential sources which have not been reported elsewhere, including Yin Zering's scheme to influence the 2020 American presidential election. Even if you're familiar with how the case played out in America, you may not be familiar with what has happened since Yin Zering was paroled from prison and deported to Germany in 2019. He began a campaign to clear his name, which started out in spectacular fashion, with Zering telling his story to millions of German TV viewers without any criticism or fact-checking. Yet skeptics soon begin to question his account, prompting a response from Zering and his allies. If you've wondered whether Zering killed the Hasems, and why so many politicians, journalists, and celebrities rallied to his cause, this book has the answers. Okay, that's enough self-promotion. Before we get into the facts, I'd like to start with an advisory. Since the documentaries were released, Yin Zering and his new team members in Germany have begun flooding the internet. Team Zering lost many of its former members. For instance, the American billionaire author John Grisham told German television in 2019 that Zering was innocent. But we haven't heard anything from John Grisham publicly in months. Grisham's interview for the Netflix series was taped long ago, as was mine. Amanda Knox released a nine-part podcast about the case in 2019. However, in September 2023, she withdrew her support after becoming convinced there was substantial evidence of Zering's guilt. Karin Steinberger, the journalist in Germany who made the 2017 pro Zering documentary Killing for Love, went silent after Jens Zering returned to Germany on parole in 2019. Recent documentaries reveal that she worked behind the scenes with pro Zering activists to try to discredit me. She recently admitted in a private editorial conference at her newspaper that she clearly violated boundaries in her treatment of this case. Her documentary is also no longer available on any streaming platform. Zuring has come out with a new series of YouTube videos in which he revives old theories and invents new ones. Zuring has even started a GoFundMe campaign to pay for his living expenses. As always, Zering does not hesitate to attack the integrity, the dignity, and the reputations of innocent people as long as he believes it serves his cause. He accuses others of perjury, conspiracy, and even murder, while reacting with outrage at any criticism directed toward him. He can dish it out, but he can't take it. Auf Deutsch, er kann austeilen, aber nicht einstecken. Zering's new supporters have also spoken out. For instance, the notorious German criminal defense lawyer Burkhard Binneken 
has released a report on the case which contains errors on almost every page. It falsely accuses me of stalking Zering and initiating an online campaign against him. A German ghostwriter, Daniela Hillers, has just released a new podcast with Judge Ralph Gieser-Ruba, president of the Hanover Regional Court. Gieser-Ruba's podcast contains dozens of factual errors and constitutes a slanderous attack on Ricky Gardner, but we'll get into that in future episodes. I encourage you to read the report and listen to the podcast, but merely for entertainment value. Both lawyer Benneken and his comrade, Judge Gieseruba, are ignorant of American law. To my knowledge, neither of them has ever studied American law, spoken to an American judge, or even been inside an American courtroom. Even good old Chuck Reed has come back into the spotlight, releasing a report which rehashes all the old, stale arguments and adds a fresh bouquet of factual mistakes. All of these last-ditch efforts aren't making much headway. The comments on Benneken's and Zering's YouTube videos show that most viewers have not been convinced. With that advisory out of the way, let's take an initial look at the Zering case. To start off, I want to establish the basics and take a look at the evidence the jury relied on to convict Yin Zering. Until recently, this evidence was merely glossed over in media reports, which tended to solely react to Zering's claims. But the evidence is key to understanding why he spent 33 years in prison. I will rely mostly on facts and evidence presented in court, but will also cite some books and reports which weren't presented to the jury, but which help provide context. We'll begin with an overview of the case. In the autumn of 1984, Yin Zering was an 18-year-old freshman student at the University of Virginia, UVA, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Zuring, a German national, was the son of a German diplomat. Zuring had lived in Cyprus, Thailand, and Germany before his family settled in the U.S. Zuring was a good student, and he received a prestigious merit-based scholarship at UVA, which provided full tuition. While at UVA, Zuring met Elizabeth Hasen. Hasen was also a freshman, but she had started college late and was 20 years old. Hasem was the daughter of Derek and Nancy Hasem, who lived in a suburb of the city of Lynchburg, Virginia, in a house they called Loose Chippings. Loose Chippings is just the British term for road gravel. Derek Hasem was a South African national and a business executive who had worked in Zimbabwe, Canada, and the United States. In 1985, when he was murdered, he was 72 years old and retired. His wife, Nancy Hasem, was 19 years younger than him and came from a prominent Anglo-American family. The Hasems were upper middle class, but not rich. They had five children from previous marriages, but Elizabeth Hasem was their only mutual biological child. Elizabeth had been sent to prestigious boarding schools in Switzerland and England, where she excelled academically. In 1983, she ran away from her English boarding school. She spent months backpacking through Europe with a female friend. They experimented with sex and drugs and life on the margins of society. She eventually returned to her family in Virginia and got her education back on track. She won the same prestigious scholarship Yin Zering had and started as a freshman at the UVA in the fall of 1984. While at UVA, Yinz and Elizabeth fell deeply in love. They exchanged passionate, very strange letters in which they shared their intellectual interests and professed their love for one another. In early 1985, their friends at UVA noticed that Yinz and Elizabeth had become inseparable. Yinz was by far the more possessive half of this relationship. He adjusted his class schedule to spend as much time with Elizabeth as possible and complained when she did not tell him where she had been. A mutual friend of the couple, Eric Greenberg, described Zering's behavior as pathological. Elizabeth Hasem complained to Zering bitterly about her parents, Derek and Nancy Hasem. She claimed they were cold and abusive, that they exploited her financial dependence on them to control her life, and that she could never be free until they were out of the way. They were also trying to sabotage the relationship between Yins and Elizabeth. Yin Zuring began, in his own words, to hate them for this. On March 29, 1985, 
Jens and Elizabeth rented a car and drove from Charlottesville, Virginia to Washington, D.C. This is about a two and a half hour drive. They stayed at the Marriott Hotel in Washington. On March 30th, 1985, Jens drove their rental car, a Chevrolet Chevette, about 200 miles to Lynchburg, Virginia. There, after a confrontation at Loose Chippings, he stabbed Derek and Nancy Hasem to death. Both victims struggled intensely, especially Derek Hasem. Both were stabbed multiple times and nearly decapitated. Jens then cleaned up the crime scene. He removed every object he had touched. He wiped away his fingerprints. He took his shoes off to avoid leaving bloody shoe prints. He smeared the blood around the floor to obscure any prints. Jens cut his left hand during his death struggle with Derek Hasem. Jens wrapped a cloth around his hand, but not before leaving blood at the murder scene. Jens' efforts were partially successful. He managed to remove all of his fingerprints and left only a partial shoe print. He did, however, leave a bloody sock print. Jens then drove back to Washington, arriving at the Washington Marriott Hotel at around 2.30 a.m. Jens told Elizabeth to go down to the garage and thoroughly clean the car. She did so twice. Jens and Elizabeth then drove back to Charlottesville, Virginia on March 31, 1985. They continued their relationship, traveling to Europe together and taking summer school classes in 1985. On October 6, 1985, Zuring traveled to Bedford County, where the murders occurred, to speak to two investigators for the Bedford County Sheriff's Office, Ricky Gardner and Chuck Reed. During the interview, the detectives asked Zuring to provide them with fingerprint, blood, and footprint samples for comparison to the crime scene. Zuring refused, but promised he would give the samples later after thinking the matter over. Instead, on October 13, 1985, he wiped the fingerprints from his apartment, drained his bank account, and flew to Belgium. He left his own car at the airport, wiping the fingerprints from it as well. Elizabeth Hasem joined him in Europe shortly thereafter. The pair traveled the world for eight months, making a living by check fraud and other petty fraud schemes. Eventually, they landed in London. There, they made their living by another check fraud scheme. One of the pair would buy an expensive item with a bad check, then the other would return it for cash before the check bounced. Their suspicious behavior attracted the attention of a store detective. She followed them and notified a police officer. Jens and Elizabeth agreed to accompany officers to the police station in Richmond, a suburb of London, England. There, they initially claimed to be a Canadian couple with the last name of No, in O-E. Authorities soon confirmed their check fraud scheme and charged them. Yins gave police permission to search their small flat in London, where police found false papers and a heavy suitcase full of documents. Detective Constable Terry Wright read through the document trove and found suspicious references to fingerprints, detectives, and Bedford County. Through hard police work, Wright discovered that the young couple were in fact suspects in the killings of Derek and Nancy Hasem. Bedford County Detective Ricky Gardner flew to London, accompanied by Prosecutor Jim Updike. Along with Detective Constable Wright and Detective Sergeant Kenneth Beaver, they interrogated Yins and Elizabeth separately for four days, from June 5, 1986 to June 8, 1986. Yins immediately told detectives he had murdered two people and that he was terrified of the death penalty. Earlier on June 5, 1986, Zuring was clearly warned by his lawyer, solicitor Keith Barker, not to speak to police without a lawyer present. Zuring chose to ignore Barker's advice, eventually providing detectives with a detailed confession to the Hasem murders. Approximately five hours of recordings of Zuring's confessions to police exist. Elizabeth initially remained silent, but after learning that Zuring had already implicated her, she confessed to her part in the crime, which was to stay behind in Washington and create an alibi for both of them. Yins and Elizabeth were both charged with murder, and Bedford County requested that they be extradited to the U.S. to stand trial. Elizabeth Hazem agreed to extradition and arrived in the U.S. in 1987. She pleaded guilty to two counts of the crime of being an accessory before the fact to capital murder. 
she was not offered a deal by the prosecution. As a result of her plea, Bedford County Circuit Court Judge William Sweeney had the authority to give her any sentence from 20 years to life in prison. After a hearing in early October 1987, Sweeney gave her two 45-year sentences to run consecutively. Zuring, by contrast, fought extradition all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. In a case called Zuring versus the United Kingdom, that court ruled in 1989 that Zuring could not be extradited unless Virginia agreed not to seek the death penalty against him. Virginia gave up the death penalty and Zuring was extradited. His 1990 trial in Bedford County was one of the first ever to be televised. Zuring took the stand and, for the first time, changed his story. He told the jury that it was actually Elizabeth Hasten who had murdered both of her parents in a drug-fueled rage. Zuring said he realized she could be fried in the electric chair for the crime, so he decided to confess instead of her. He claims the knowledge of the crime scene within his confessions was all second-hand, derived only from things Elizabeth had told him shortly after the killings. The jury disbelieved his story and recommended that he be sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment. Judge Sweeney accepted this recommendation. Using financing provided by his family and the German government, Zuring filed appeals before the Virginia Supreme Court and the United States federal courts in the area. When the Supreme Court of the United States declined to hear his last appeal in 2001, the courts were now closed to him forever. Every judge to hear his case found that his trial was fair and that his claims of error had no merit. Zuring's only chance at this point was to receive pardon or parole from the governor of Virginia. He also asked to be transferred to Germany to serve his sentence. Eventually, with the help of celebrities such as the actor Martin Sheen, the author John Grisham, and the music producer Jason Flom, Zuring was paroled and deported to Germany in November 2019. He agreed to conditions of his parole, which included no contact with the victim's family, uniform good behavior, and a permanent ban on entry to the U.S. Zuring may never return to America. The parole board explicitly rejected Zuring's innocence claims, finding that a years-long exhaustive investigation had found them all to be meritless. Zuring is thus a free man, but he remains a convicted double murderer. He has told his supporters that once he landed in Germany, he planned to market his life story and to convince the German media that he was innocent. As he put it, he wanted to obtain a pardon from the media, which he had not received from Virginia Governor Ralph Northam. Zuring toured nationwide German talk shows and gave interviews to prominent media outlets such as the magazine Der Spiegel. He also signed a book deal, said to be in the low six figures, with Random House. This resulted in the publication of the book Return to Life, My First Year in Freedom After 33 Years in Prison, which was published in September 2021. However, Zuring's account was soon challenged by skeptics, including a former member of his inner circle. His case was the focus of the true crime podcast The Zuring System, first broadcast in German in early 2022 and now available in English. The podcast, the product of thorough research, examines Zuring's innocence claims and his freedom campaign from a critical perspective. It has now been downloaded well over 1.5 million times in German and has changed public perception of the case fundamentally. As I noted above, Zuring's case was featured in ambitious feature-length documentaries on German public television and on Netflix, which were broadcast in early November 2023. These films featured interviews with people, including me, who believe Zuring's conviction was justified. Zuring has already reacted to these unflattering portrayals with a series of angry YouTube videos in both English and German. The German language documentaries have now been viewed by well over one million people. This brings you up to speed with the case. Now let's look in depth at the key evidence in the case. Item 1. The Confessions Yin Zering's confessions are by far the most important evidence against him. 
After he was arrested in 1986 in Richmond, England for check fraud, English detectives read through the archives Zuring had brought with him across the world, and they found references to fingerprints, detectives, and other suspicious matters. English detectives obtained a court order permitting them to question Zuring and Hasem for four days. Zuring and Hasem were interrogated separately in the Richmond Police Station by Detective Constable Terry Wright, Detective Sergeant Kenneth Beaver, both from Scotland Yard, and Investigator Ricky Gardner from Bedford County. Bedford County Commonwealth's attorney Jim Updike also flew to London. He did not participate in the interviews, but he did give legal advice. When detectives notified Zuring that he would be questioned about the Hasem murders, he spontaneously admitted that he had murdered two people and that he was terrified of being executed. Over the next four days, from June 5th to June 8th, 1986, Zuring provided detectives with a thorough account of the murders, telling them when, where, and why he had committed them. As the interview progressed, Zuring admitted more and more details of the crime. This is very common, and it's known to police as a rolling confession. Only on the 8th of June did Zuring give a full, detailed, explicit account of the killings. This interview was not recorded at Zuring's request, but all three detectives took extensive notes, and Zuring admitted at trial that those notes were accurate. Zuring also implicated Elizabeth Hasem as an accomplice to the murders, by telling detectives that the two had spoken about murder and that she knew he had planned to kill her parents unless they agreed to allow the pair to continue their relationship and that she had also agreed to provide him with an alibi in Washington by buying two pairs of movie tickets and two room service dinners. In the autumn of 1986, Zuring went on to provide detailed confessions of the crime to two British forensic psychiatrists, Dr. Henrietta Bullard and Dr. John Hamilton. In these confessions, Zuring described his mental state of hatred toward the Hasems and his utter devotion to Elizabeth, whom he called his goddess. He killed the Hasems primarily because he felt they were trying to end his relationship with Elizabeth, which was in fact true. On December 30, 1986, Zuring gave another detailed confession to a German prosecutor from the West German capital of Bonn, a man named Bernd Koenig. Zuring was accompanied by his own defense lawyer, Professor Dr. Andreas Frieser, who was allowed to consult with Zuring for 20 minutes before the interview. In this interview, Zuring sums up his mental state at the time of the crime, and I quote, The way I see it, for many years, certain problems have built up inside me, which perhaps other people around their 18th year, teenagers, have. All of these problems appeared to come to a solution when I met Elizabeth, and I believe that the relationship with Elizabeth prepared me for this matter, and certain tendencies within me which led to this act increased and that the matter on this evening ended as it ended, since I drank alcohol for the first time after a long period, and for me relatively much alcohol, and that because of the alcohol and all these things erupted, and the entire anger and all these problems were discharged. Those are Zuring's own words, spoken in the presence of his own defense lawyer. Zuring's confessions were obtained voluntarily, without coercion or trickery, Therefore, they were all admitted into evidence at his trial. The jury heard five hours of taped confessions from Yenzering, speaking in his own voice. His confessions contained many pieces of information which only the actual killer could have learned. As retired German police commissioner Siegfried Stang observed in his 2022 book about the case, entitled Nebelkerzen, or Smoke Screens, Zuring's confessions matched the crime scene evidence 99%. From a legal perspective, Zuring's confessions are important for two reasons. First, under American criminal law, and that of almost every other developed nation, a voluntary, reliable confession made by an adult of sound mind is extremely strong evidence of guilt. Once the confession is admitted as evidence, the prosecution's only remaining task is to corroborate it with other pieces of evidence. 
1989, the Virginia Court of Appeals held in Watkins v. Commonwealth, where, as here, the accused has fully confessed the crime, only slight corroborative evidence is necessary to establish the corpus delicti, i.e. that a crime in fact occurred. It is not necessary, however, that there be independent corroboration of all the contents of the confession or even of all of the elements of the crime. Zuring fully confessed this crime. Thus, the prosecution did not have to build a case from scratch. They were already 90% of the way to the finish line and just needed slight corroboration. Here, there was massive corroboration in the form of Elizabeth Hasem's testimony, the diary entries, the sock print, and the typo blood, among other pieces. Second, Zuring's confessions mean that this is not a circumstantial case. A circumstantial case exists when there are no eyewitnesses or other direct evidence of a crime. Here there was an eyewitness who observed the murders firsthand, Yen Zuring. His confessions contain many details which you could not possibly have learned secondhand from Elizabeth Hasem. To quote the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, Zuring's confessions and the corroboration constitute overwhelming evidence that Zuring personally killed the Hasems. Item 2. Elizabeth Hasem's Testimony During their June 1986 interrogations in London, Zuring confessed the crime and implicated Elizabeth Hasem as an accomplice to murder, a crime which carried a sentence of from 20 years to life in prison. While Zuring was confessing, Hasem herself remained silent. Only when detectives told her they were very happy with the results of their questioning of Yin Zuring did she break her silence. She was dismayed that he had confessed and implicated her. So she decided to confess to her part in the crime, staying in Washington, D.C. and creating an alibi. Her statement thus dovetailed precisely with Zuring's. Zuring said he drove to Lynchburg to kill the Hasems while Elizabeth stayed in Washington to create an alibi. And that's also what she said. Elizabeth testified at Zuring's 1990 trial. She discussed their relationship, the process that led to the murder, her efforts to create an alibi, and how she bandaged Zuring's hand wound and cleaned bloodstains from the rental car. She described when and why the couple decided to flee the United States after Zuring's disastrous October 6, 1985 interview with Bedford County. She described their world travels and the London check fraud scheme, and how she found out that Zuring had confessed the murders and implicated her as his accomplice. Elizabeth was cross-examined for hours by Zuring's legal team, lawyers Richard Neaton and William Cleveland. They pointed to inconsistencies in her statements, her drug use, and her manipulation of Yin Zuring. The jury thus heard both sides of the story, and knew that Elizabeth had changed her story as to some secondary points. At the end of the day, however, the basic outline of her story remained intact, plausible, and convincing. After all, Hasem had nothing to gain by testifying. She had already pleaded guilty and had already begun serving two 45-year prison sentences. She testified against Zuring for the reasons she has always stated. She knew he had killed her parents and she wanted him to face justice. Item 3. The Flight from the USA During the summer of 1985, Elizabeth Hasem gave police blood, fingerprint, and footprint samples. Zuring, however, dodged and delayed. During his interview on October 6, 1985, Zuring refused to give samples but said he would think about it. He later phoned police to say he would give the samples but wanted to wait until after midterm exams. It's important to remember here that Zuring at this point did not know that police hadn't found any bloody fingerprints at the crime scene. Instead of fulfilling the police's request, Zuring drained his bank account, wiped his fingerprints from his car in his apartment, and flew to Brussels. In doing so, he gave up a 100% expenses paid scholarship to one of the world's great universities. Elizabeth Hasem followed him shortly thereafter, giving up the same scholarship. Zuring left letters behind in which he vaguely claimed to be dissatisfied with university life. Zuring's flight from the United States is more than simply suspicious. 
it is admissible evidence that he is guilty of murdering the Hasems. In United States v. Grandmont, a 1982 case by the Federal First Circuit Court of Appeals, the court restates the ancient common law rule. It is well established that flight and efforts at concealment or falsification of identity may be admitted at trial as bearing upon the guilt of the accused. Here we have both flight and concealment of identity. The jury was thus entitled to conclude that Zuring fled the United States to avoid giving police forensic evidence samples. They were further entitled to conclude that he refused to give these samples because he feared they would link him to the crime. They did come to both of these conclusions. Occam's razor says the simplest explanation is usually the best. The simplest explanation for Zuring's behavior is that he fled to avoid giving fingerprint, blood, and footprint samples. This is direct proof of his guilt. Item 4. The Letters and Diaries Over Christmas 1984, Zuring returned to visit his family in Detroit. In his interviews with psychiatrist John Hamilton, Zuring referred to this separation from Elizabeth as mental torture. Zuring wrote a 39-page letter to Elizabeth Hasem during this period. This extraordinary document, which can be read in full online, reveals several things. First, Zuring was a profoundly insecure virgin who was completely transfixed by his relationship with Elizabeth Hasem. Here are a few excerpts. About Elizabeth, he said, The most incredible person in the world loving you with every bone in her body or pretending so well it doesn't make a difference. I've even got Elizabeth believing I'm worthwhile, but I'm not, because I can show nothing. I'm even fucked up inside, and really fucked up, too. Look at this, what I'm writing. I'm a fucking schizo. After a while, she'll realize the pile of fake shit I am, and leave me in an even worse mess, and I might hurt her, too. Emotionally, you know. I know that I'm harping much too much on the oh me, oh my, she's a gonna leave me thing. I got your letter on the 3rd of January and I was getting paranoid. I am still, but much less so. Look, I'll really try to keep it under control, okay? I could have edited all that shit out, but somehow I wanted to leave this complete. I love you. Zering's entire identity was now wrapped up in the relationship with his goddess. He later told psychiatrists he considered himself and Elizabeth to be one person. Classmate Eric Greenberg, as we've seen, described his clingy and possessive behavior toward Elizabeth as pathological. In the long Christmas letter, Zuring toyed with the idea of violence, including against Elizabeth's parents, writing, My God, how I've got the dinner scene planned out. He wrote, I've felt this. I'm feeling it now inside me, this need to plant one's foot in somebody's face, to always crush. I have not yet explored the side of me that wishes to crush to any real extent. I have yet to kill, possibly the ultimate act of crushing. He also noted there had been many burglaries in the area where the Hasems lived, but that this time the burglary could go wrong and the unfortunate owners... These excerpts were read to the jury. They provide proof of three things. First, Zuring's total psychological dependence on Elizabeth Hasem. Second, Zuring's fascination with violence. Third, Zuring was at this point already contemplating scenarios which involved doing violence to Derek and Nancy Hasem. When Hasem and Zuring were arrested in London, police found a travel diary they had jointly maintained to chronicle their dramatic worldwide flight from the law. In an entry dated October 12, 1985, one day before Zuring indeed fled the country, Elizabeth writes, The case is about to be solved. Perhaps fingerprints on a coffee mug used by Yin's in Bedford interview gave him away. Zuring has admitted that he read this entry. During his trial, he declared it was a joke, although he would change this story later. Elizabeth Hasem, testifying at Zuring's trial, stated from her own personal experience, It was our belief that the police had fingerprints, a partial fingerprint in blood. We thought that it was Jens's, and we thought that when he had gone to Bedford and had his interview with Ricky Gardner, 
that the coffee cup that he had used, that they had lifted the fingerprints off of the coffee cup and matched it to this fingerprint. Occam's razor says that, all things considered, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. The diary entry proves that Zuring fled the U.S. for a very simple reason. He was afraid he would soon be arrested because he had inadvertently left a fingerprint behind on a coffee mug during his October 6th interview in Bedford County. Item 5. The Bloody Sock Print Police discovered a bloody sock print in the living room of loose chippings. During Zuring's trial, an impression examiner named Robert Hallett compared the bloody sock print to an impression of Zuring's foot. Hallett was not giving scientific expert testimony. Zuring's lawyers had correctly pointed out that there was no scientific method for tracing a sock print to one specific person. It's not like fingerprints or DNA. Both the judge and the prosecutor agreed. Therefore, Hallett could only testify in general terms that the sock print was consistent with Yin Zuring's foot. In his 1995 ebook, Mortal Thoughts, Yin Zuring agreed, saying that his footprint and the sock print were remarkably similar. This was proven to the jury by comparing photographs of the two. Zuring's lawyers cross examined Hallett. Hallett admitted that he could not say Zuring made the sock print, and that thousands of other people could have left it, and that it was impossible to completely exclude that even Elizabeth could have left the sock print. The jury thus heard a full discussion of the sock print's importance, with good points being made by both sides. The defense did not introduce their own expert to challenge Hallett. Given that Richard Neaton and William Cleveland were two experienced criminal defense lawyers with ample private resources for investigators and experts, it is certain that they did consult their own expert to check whether Hallett's conclusions were correct. The response they got was not helpful, so they did not call the expert to the witness stand. During his closing argument, prosecutor Jim Updike stated that the sock print fit Zuring's foot like a glove. This was a fair and accurate statement, since gloves can fit thousands of people. In the recent Netflix series about the case, forensic podiatrist Dr. Sarah Reel compared Zuring's footprint to the bloody sock print and concluded it lines up quite well and was a close match and a much better match than any other figure connected to the case. The sock print corroborates Zuring's confessions. The sock print did not prove Zuring's presence at the crime scene. It didn't have to prove that because Zuring's confessions proved that. The sock print merely bolstered his confessions as being accurate and reliable. Item 6. The Type O Blood The story is similar with the Type O Blood. Forensic experts found traces of Type O blood, Zuring's blood type, in the bathroom of the house and on the frame of the front door. Zuring has Type O blood. Nancy, Derek, and Elizabeth Hasem have other blood types. During Zuring's 1990 trial, DNA testing was only in its infancy and required a blood stain the size of a large coin to yield accurate results. After the blood group testing, there was insufficient blood left for DNA testing at that time. Things have changed since then. About 45% of the U.S. population has type O blood. Therefore, the blood at the crime scene also does not definitively place Zuring there. However, it corroborates his confessions. Zuring said he had cut himself during his death struggle with Derek Hasem and had bled profusely at the crime scene. Typo blood was found in the downstairs bathroom, where Zuring initially bandaged his hand, and on the front door frame. According to his confessions, Zuring went in and out of the house through that door several times. Blood of his type was thus found in two locations where Zuring, in his confessions, said he had been. Now for a few final thoughts. There was other evidence against Zuring, but these six items formed the core of the state's case. When Zuring and his supporters, such as Judge Ralph Gizaruba, look at the case, they commit a fundamental legal and logical error. They fail to look at all of the evidence in context. Instead, they single out individual pieces of evidence and criticize them on their own. 
This is what Siegfried Stang, the retired police commissioner, refers to as Zuring's smoke screens, this obsession with individual bits of evidence ignoring the big picture. In any legal case, the evidence must be evaluated as an organic whole. A jury or court must examine how all the evidence connects into a unified picture, like pieces of a puzzle. Even if you remove a few pieces of a puzzle, it is still possible to see that the overall image is a horse or a city. Here, the six key pieces of evidence I have described, along with many others, form a clearly recognizable portrait of the killer of Derek and Nancy Hasen. Yin's Zuring. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Post questions or comments below and I'll be happy to answer them. I'll be releasing other videos going into more depth about some of the fascinating issues in this case, such as DNA, the confessions, Zuring's friends of Yin's, his political and celebrity supporters, the role of Elizabeth Hasem, and of course, Zuring's many changing, evolving stories over the years. If there's interest, I'll be happy to do a live chat and answer any and all questions you might have about the case or about me. Our journey has just begun. Together, we're going to clear away the spin and deceptions and recover the truth. And we will also defend the reputation of people Zuring and his team members keep attacking to this day. Thank you for watching.